Hi. Juno X from Roland takes the familiar interface of the classic 106 and combines it with the sample and virtual analog capabilities of its Zencore engine and the scene and IR features introduced in the Jupiter X and XM. It comes with thousands of presets, several bundled classic Roland synth models, and can be expanded with even more engines and presets. It can play four synth timbres simultaneously in splits and layers with another fifth drum part, each of which can be controlled either by an arpeggiator, a simple sequencer, or Roland's iArpeggiator that modifies patterns based on how you play the keyboard. In this video, I'll take an in-depth look at Juno X, its pros and cons overall, and how it compares to other Zencore products. Before I start, a quick disclosure, Roland sent Juno X over for review, but as always, they have no say over the content of this video. This channel is funded by viewers who subscribe to my content and book updates on Patreon, YouTube Premium and Ads, and price check affiliate links in the description, which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, let's get going. Juno X may look like a Juno 106, and from a few comparisons I've seen on YouTube, it can also sound like one, but that's really only a small subset of what it can do. It's based on the same Zencore platform that powers hardware synths like Phantom, the MC-707 and MC-101, as well as the Jupiter X and XM, and also Roland's software synth plugin, Xenology. So if you're looking at this entire series, or should I say if you're listening for the differences, they should all sound the same. The difference between all these synths is in how they give you access and wrap Zencore with hardware controls, interfaces, performance controls, sequencers, arpeggiators, and so on. So for example, the Phantom series synths have bigger screens, which are extremely helpful when editing hundreds of available Zencore synth engine parameters, whereas Juno X and Jupiter X shown you mainly parameter lists for things that aren't available as controls on the panel. That said, Juno X and the Jupiter Xs have control software you can use to access many of these parameters if you've got a computer nearby. More on that later. If we compare Juno X and Jupiter X to the Phantom and MC series, they have by far more comprehensive sequencing features and you can load up your own samples into them, which you can't currently hear. That said, they don't have the IR features you'll find on the Juno X and Jupiter X. So there are pros and cons for each, even if you set aside the fact that they have the same engine and sound the same. As far as differences between Juno X and the Jupiter X and XM. All three synths have four polyphonic synth parts and a fifth drum part. You can split, layer, sequence, and arpeggiate the five parts the same way. They have the same structure of scenes, parts, models, the menus are the same. There are a few differences in the physical controls, aside from sliders versus knobs. The Jupiters have mod and pitch bend wheels, which the Juno X doesn't. And the Jupiters have four arrow keys, as opposed to only two left and right keys here and up and down is shared with this encoder. So sort of you enter a menu and then you can edit parameters like this. And when necessary, you can move between screens using the left and right buttons here. Juno X does have a few control advantages, probably because it came after the Jupiters. For example, this part level control is handy to control the level of each of the four synth parts and the rhythmic part. It also has the step sequencer functions silk screened and available here, as opposed to the Jupiters, which uh, applied those functions to the S1 through S3 keys. But I don't think you're missing out on any main features. Another small perk Juno X has compared to the XM is the color control buttons. However, XM is the only one in the series that can be powered by batteries. Hardware controls aside, there's a difference in the bundled models you get with the Juno X compared to the Jupiters. Each has an exclusive model built as a modern extension of the original hardware. So for example, in addition to the Juno 106 and Juno 60 models, there is a Juno X model here, which has among other a super saw function. On the Jupiter X and XM, it's the Jupiter X model with four oscillators. So those are exclusive to each of the synths, at least as of now. There is, however, a Juno 106 model on the Jupiter Xs and a Jupiter 8 model you can purchase for the Juno X. 
Both Jupiter X and Juno X come bundled with models of the Juno 106, the XV5080, RD Piano, and Vocoder. The Juno X comes with an additional Juno 60 model and a bunch of presets for it, whereas on the Jupiter Xs you've got SH101 and JX8P models with their presets. Unlike the Jupiter X model, which you can't buy, you can actually buy or rent the SH101 or JX8P models for the Juno X. So for example, I've installed those models here. They just appear if we uh, scroll through the models over here. So both JX8P with its presets and uh, the SH101 with its presets. So quite a few of those. And uh, you can also install the JD800 model, which isn't included either on the Juno X or the Jupiter X. So these two also come with uh, a bunch of presets. So to summarize, for the models that aren't bundled with either synth, you can either purchase them on Roland's cloud and transfer them over USB to live here permanently, or if you have a Roland Cloud subscription and the WC1 adapter, you can rent them as well, as long as you have a subscription. More on this later. Extra models aside, both come bundled with thousands of Zencore presets in addition to the vintage models. So yes, you can download more models and content, but there's plenty to get going with. So that's it for where Juno X sits within Roland's current synth offerings. Let's take a deeper look at the instrument itself. Physically, it definitely has the mojo of a Juno 106. The build feels excellent. It's got a metal enclosure. The sides are plastic, but it's quite heavy at almost 12 kilos or 25 pounds. The key bed is synth action and it feels excellent to me. It's both velocity sensitive and has monophonic aftertouch, which is maybe a little stiff, but does give you a um, fairly good degree of control. It's mono aftertouch, so if you play a chord, pressure will modulate all the notes in the chord. The sliders, buttons, and encoders all feel excellent. The one part where I think it literally would have been nice to see more is the screen. Overall, if you're just going to be selecting presets and modifying them using the sliders, then you won't be using the screen much. But if you want to dig in to the hundreds of parameters that are available, especially in the Zencore engines, then uh, you'll be scrolling through long lists. If you hit shift, by the way, you can jump between parameter categories. If I go ahead and um, let's go into part four, edit a Zencore part, then each of the partials has substantially more parameters than the synth models. Again, you can jump through categories using shift. Luckily, there's the optional companion editor. If you have a computer nearby, more on that later. Juno X also has four speakers, but they're what I would consider for emergency use only, and they just don't do justice to the sounds that this can create. Personally, I just turn them off. In terms of the sound design hands-on controls, they're designed with the Juno X model in mind. So they'll work best with that. For example, I mentioned earlier, turning the super saw on or off, sub oscillator, noise, uh, different waveform levels, pitch controls, so I won't go through uh, all the sound design controls that are here. Some of them, by the way, go beyond the Juno X model. So for example, here, the Juno X model only has two envelopes. You can only select either the pitch envelope or the filter slash amp envelope. But if I was to choose one of the other parts, um, say this one, which is based on the XV model, then you've got individual control over each of the uh, envelopes, for example. Now, even the Juno X model has a few parameters that aren't available on the on the panel. So, for example, if we just leave the um, square wave. So let's say that I wanted PWM on this. If you're familiar with the Juno 106, you'd be looking for the PWM switch. It doesn't exist here. That's a parameter that's not available on the panel. The way you access that is if you hold shift and touch a parameter, you'll reach that parameter in the menu system 
And related parameters are typically around that. So for example, in here, the PW mode, the PWM mode is on manual, but if I set it to LFO, then we now have PWM. Just to round out the description of the panel controls before we get to these buttons, on the left are three customizable buttons and two customizable sliders. If you want to see what these do within a patch, just hold shift and touch a slider or a button and you'll see what it controls right here on screen. And as per the PWM control, you can access additional parameters right here. Now, as you move beyond the Juno X to other models, then the uh, controls sometimes work a little bit differently. So for example, if I go back into the, um, into the XV engine, you'll see that these sliders now don't control noise, uh, the sub oscillator or waveforms, but rather partial levels. Partials are basically different voices that exist within one XV or Zencore patch. And for example, here, this slider no longer controls PWM slash mod, but rather the fine tune control of this patch. So for the most part, the controls are related to the different models, but you can either check the manual or just touch the control and it'll show you what it does on screen. So those are the overall sound design controls for Juno X. Let's talk about these colorful buttons here. They've got five different modes or function types, especially the ones numbered one through 16. The first mode or use for these buttons is scene selection. You've got up to 256 scenes on the Juno X. You select the scene bank by holding scene and pressing the uh, buttons one through 16. And then once you've selected a bank, you can choose the scene within that bank. So bank five, scene three or four, Scenes can be either a single part or a split and can contain up to four parts and a rhythmic part. So uh, typically scenes 15 and 16 in banks are complex arrangements of multiple parts with a rhythm section, with the arpeggio, all starting up their little party based on what you play. The Juno X, by the way, doesn't cut off sounds as you transition between scenes, but uh, it does cut off arpeggiated patterns. And uh, you have to give it a few seconds to transition, otherwise uh, it won't play the pattern in full if you want to transition when patterns are active, but if it's just sounds, then transitions are uh, fairly seamless. So that's use number one for these buttons, loading up scenes, which are basically entire machine states, parts, beats, sequences, arpeggiator effects, all that lives within scenes. Then the second use is part management. When you press part, these bottom labels apply as opposed to the ones on top in scene selection. You choose the part you want to edit by pressing these buttons and you can edit more than one part at once. Then you can choose which parts listen to the keyboard over here. Again, parts one through four and the rhythm part. Even if these parts don't listen to the keyboard, they can still be part of the arpeggio. So let's, for example, take a scene with something going on. So here only parts one and two are listening to the keyboard, but the drums and other parts can still be active using the IR arpeggiator. And you can assign different functions to these. By default, you can mute parts like this. And there are a few other options. So for example, with shift, you can choose to turn the arpeggiator on or off uh, for parts. Anyway, that's the second mode for these buttons. And then the third mode is another tap on the part button, which gets you into function mode. This lets you control the oscillators or partials within a tone partials one through four. And again, you can edit multiple partials at once. And this lets you turn partials on or off, partials or oscillators, depending on the model. If you exit this mode, by the way, you can always see here on the bottom, which oscillators are active, which oscillator you're editing. And if we go back into parts, which part you're editing, which parts are listening to the arpeggiator. And then one more thing about this 
function mode, aside from changing what these buttons do, it also lets you access additional parameters that are labeled in blue on the panel. So that's the third mode for these buttons. The fourth mode is the model and bank selector. So if we exit this, just to make things a little bit clearer, models are basically the uh, different synth or Zencore engines that you've got here. Now you can always select the model and the preset like this. The model slash bank functions are basically shortcuts to these. So for example, these buttons are by default set to load up synth models, the Juno X model, Juno 106, Juno 60, XV 5080, RD Piano, Vocoder, and then the um, Zencore presets and user presets. These are the presets that you can create. You can create up to 256 of your own tones. And then because there's so many Zencore presets here, you can go through different banks. Uh, for example, a synth bass bank, ensemble strings bank, ensemble brass, and so on. And you can customize all 16 buttons in model bank mode. So say for example, that I want this button to um, only be the, uh, let's say JXAP, where are you at? So a model that I downloaded, here we go, JXAP. Notice that this button's color has changed to a model color as opposed to a bank color. So now, just like I picked my models here, if I press here, I've got a JXAP bank. And you can also customize any of these to search through different banks. So again, hold this, press the button, and you can assign it to numerous other categories, um, not just the, uh, the defaults. So that's the fourth use for these buttons. And then the uh, fifth use is as a TR style step sequencer. I'll talk about this later, but basically you select a note and then plonk it down anywhere you want in the sequence. So that's the main use for these buttons. You can also use them to quickly create singles, splits, keyboard splits, or quick layers. If we go into part mode, you'll see that single turns on part one, split splits the keyboard between parts one and two. Dual also uses parts one and two. There's also a left-right dual mode, which pans one part left and one part right. In terms of connectivity, Juno X has a regular AC in jack, so no need for an adapter, thanks very much. It has five pin DIN MIDI in and out, expression and sustain pedal jacks, an auxiliary input and dynamic mic input, no phantom power. On the analog output side, it has regular left and right outputs, balanced outputs, a phone output, as well as a phone output on the front. Thank you very much where it should be. And then finally, it has both a USB type A and type B port. You can use the type A host port to hook up a USB drive for firmware updates and to transfer presets and for the wireless Roland Cloud Connect adapter, more on this later. And the USB type B port can be used both for MIDI and for audio. The Juno X can be used as a 14 in four out audio interface. So each part is sent out as its own individual stereo track and you also get uh, the entire mix and the processed audio coming in through the mic input. Juno X also has built-in Bluetooth if you want to stream audio from your phone either to the speakers or over USB to a computer. Moving on from connectivity but somewhat related, Juno X has two relevant editors, software editors from Roland. The first is the free companion Juno X editor, which effectively turns your computer into a large screen for the Juno X. This editor syncs with the synth in real time over USB, so any change you make on the synth is reflected in the editor and vice versa. So for example, this is part one, I can control its level through here, or say, turn on the drums, control the drum level through here, and any change that I make on the panel is immediately also reflected in the editor. So it quite literally acts as a BYOS, bring your own screen extension to the synth. The second app that's relevant both for Juno X and any other Zencore synth is Roland's Xenology Pro plugin, which is either a paid download or part of their cloud subscription. Unlike the Juno X editor, which acts as a screen for your Juno X, Xenology Pro is a full plugin that can play all the Xenology sounds on your computer. And it can't unfortunately act as a screen for the Juno X. The reason Xenology Pro has an edge over the Juno X editor is because uh, the Juno X editor, as we'll see in a bit, does have this pro view where you can see all the parameters of a patch in your list. 
But Synology Pro also has a visual edit mode where you can see things like the LFO shapes. It's particularly useful, uh, say for example, if you use the uh, step LFOs. Anyway, back to Juno X. The editor is a really great way to learn about what this synth can do. So I could walk you through what parameters exist in a scene and what parameters exist in a tone. And we could look at the parameters this way, go through various tabs or pages and go through the parameters in each page. But it's much clearer to see it on the editor. So let's take a look at that. The editor has three main tabs, the scene builder, the librarian, and the editor. The editor will apply to whatever it is that you choose to edit. On the left, whether you're in the scene builder or the librarian is a peek into all the content on Juno X, the scenes, preset tones, and so on. And the librarian will show you your scenes and user tones, and you can easily drag and drop and rename both scenes and tones here. Anyway, one of the things that's most complex about the Juno X is the distinction between scenes, parts, and tones. Let's go through these very quickly. Let's start with the basics, which is tones, and in particular tones that are based on the synth models. So if you double tap a uh, part, if it's a system tone, then you'll be prompted to save it somewhere so that you can edit it. Let's find an empty slot, save it there, and we can now edit the tone over here. So this is what a Juno 106 tone looks like. Here too, there's perfect sync between any changes that I make on the screen and uh, over here, of course. So this is what a visual representation of a Juno 106 tone looks like. If I go to uh, any one of my other user tones, let's say go into this one, this is what a Juno X tone looks like. Let's maybe do one more, a JX8P tone. Let's go ahead and edit that. So nice visual interfaces. And like I mentioned for the uh, XV or Zencore tones, you don't get a visual interface, just uh, lists of parameters, but it sure beats uh, looking at the parameters on this screen. So certainly if you have a computer nearby, this helps make sense of uh, Zencore or XV5080 tones. So that was an overview of what a tone looks like. Let's zoom out and look at what scenes control. Now, again, just like you can edit tone parameters over here, you can edit scene parameters uh, here as well. But here too, the Juno X editor gives us a really good look at what a scene looks like. Now, this is just the main screen of a scene. If we dive into, um, let's say, this scene in here and then double click here, we get the main mixer screen again, but a whole bunch of other tabs that are scene parameters. Again, these aren't the tone parameters. These are either parameters that apply to the scene globally or in many cases to individual parts within a scene and the parts contain tones. Now, obviously I won't go through all these parameters, but they are pretty much what you can get to uh, in the menus, except maybe for the I arpeggiator, you can't uh, sequence, control the content of the step sequencer in here. It's pretty easy though to do that using the panel controls. I'll show you that in a bit. And the sync here is pretty good. So for example, if I wanna change uh, part one's mode, you can see me toggle it between I arp, arp, and step, go into part two, and toggle it, I'm not on the right page, let's go into part two, and we can see hopefully, yeah, that toggled as well. So yeah, just a big, nice screen to control scenes as well. Now, a couple of things that confused me here, one, just a simple thing that uh, hopefully will save you time. If you go into the mixer and um, turn up, say, the uh, reverb and delay for a part, or a chorus, then uh, if you turn on drive, it apparently bypasses these, so the sound becomes dry, and you can still send um, audio to the um, effects as part of the drive effect. So that's one small thing that took me a while to figure out, and then the second thing that really baked my noodle and might save you some confusion and time is the modify section in the part tab. So let me explain what I mean. Normally, when I say touch the filter cutoff, 
I close and open the filter, meaning I change a parameter within a tone. The thing is, if I dive into the scene and go into the part control, you'll see cutoff, resonance, and a bunch of other sound design parameter controls on the scene level. And indeed, say if I move the cutoff here, it will close and open the cutoff. So what's the deal with this, with this modifying section? So these were put here with good intentions. The idea is to give you the flexibility to impact a tone in a scene without changing the actual tone parameters. So say you have a favorite tone preset that you don't want to change, just modify slightly when you use it in a particular scene to better fit it. When you use the modify control, you're not changing the original preset, you're just creating an offset in the part in the scene. So let's, for example, maybe I'll just reload the scene so we get a fresh start. If I now change the filter cutoff and go ahead and want to save the scene, you'll see that I've already edited the part's tone. Let's exit this, reload the scene again. If I go into the editor and change the offset, then go ahead and want to save the scene, you'll see the scene was edited, but the tone wasn't. So I don't need to save two things, I only need to save one. So that's the good thing about scene modify controls versus tone controls. There's only one slight catch. The question is, when I touch these sliders, what am I controlling, the tone value or the scene offset? And the answer is, it depends if I'm using a model or a uh, Zencore or XV5080 patch. If I'm using any one of the synth models, the answer is, you only control the tone parameters with these sliders. And you know you're controlling a tone parameter when you see a high resolution value here, a three digit or even four digit number. If I want to edit the scene offset for this parameter in one of these models, I need to do it either through the menu or through the Juno editor. However, if I choose an XV model or Zencore patch, then I can use the onboard controls to control either the offset or the tone based on whether I choose the scene mode or the model bank mode. If I'm in model bank mode, then I control the tone parameter. And you can see a three digit number here and in most other cases. However, if I press the scene button, I now control scene offsets, in which case you can see a one or two digit number and a little plus or minus before the button, and this is, uh, scene offsets have a lower resolution, only between minus 64 and plus 63. The slight challenge is that some parameters also have a plus or minus in the uh, tone mode. So that's the part of this relatively powerful feature, which gives you scene modifiers that I found a bit confusing, just because of the different behavior of the model and scene buttons based on the model that you're editing. Okay, so hopefully now you know what a scene, what a part, what a tone, and maybe even what a partial is. Let's talk briefly about the I arpeggiator. Like I mentioned earlier, it has three modes. Arp is probably the, uh, the simplest one. You hold keys and there are a few, uh, so you kick the tempo up a bit here. Variations, styles. So quite a few of those, but uh, the regular ARP won't respond to how you play. That's what the IARP does. Anyway, um, these are the basic controls for the uh, ARP, and you can always go into the menu and uh, edit additional parameters. For example, um, say octave range or different motifs, like Stranger Things mode. Anyway, so standard arpeggiator stuff. The iARP is where the fun begins. Let's maybe choose something more interesting. So the idea with the iARP is that it both controls multiple parts in a way that makes sense, but it also responds to how you play. So if I play slightly more uh, excitedly, rhythm changes and the chords change as well. And if I wanted to stop detecting how I play, Q, 
keep the beat, then I just turn this button off. And regardless of how calmly I play now, the beat won't change. I can also have it uh, start responding to the keys that I press, say if I wanted to solo over a pattern without uh, changing the notes that are held within the arpeggiator. There are a bunch of other arpeggiator parameters that I won't go through here. Uh, for example, uh, probabilities and uh, quite a few options for probabilities. Let's talk about the third arp mode for parts, which is the step sequencer. You can use the step sequencer to sequence drum or synth parts. Let's maybe start with a drum part. So I load it up a drum part, go into step edit mode. You can see this pattern has 32 steps. You can shorten the pattern just by shortening like this. Let's say go for 16 steps. Now, whether you're sequencing drums or notes, you can only sequence up to 16 notes within a single pattern. So choose your notes or drums wisely. C2 is a kick. I can plonk that. Uh, using the TR style sequencer and just preview that, play it back. I can audition other sounds. This takes up a second slot out of 16. And yeah, just plonk that down wherever I want. It'll place in the velocity with which I press the, uh, the hi-hat, by the way. So that's one way to sequence. Another, where's my snare? Right here is just to play live so I could hit play, hit record. And then sequence that way. Since there's no metronome here, it might be a good idea to sequence even a basic rhythmic part before you play melodic parts live. And then melodic sequencing works pretty much the same way. Let's go into uh, a different part. A few more ways you can sequence. You can hold a step and then play a chord. And then that gets sequenced. If you want to hold the note, press shift and the step you want to hold it to. And we can do that for the other notes in the chord. So we've now created a held chord. And then the last way you can sequence, if I erase this, just hit record and you can sequence. Let's keep that. SH-101 style. And there are a bunch more uh, sequencing features here. One of them is, if I go into arpeggiator edit, is the key shift, key shift on. If I turn that on, then I can use the keyboard to transpose the pattern. So that's step sequencing in the I arpeggiator in a nutshell. The last thing I wanted to talk about before we head out to the pros and cons is how you add models and content to the Juno X using the Roland Cloud and the WC1 wireless adapter. Like I mentioned earlier, Juno X comes with these models and you can buy lifetime keys to additional models and install them with a USB stick using the USB jack in the back. Some instrument packs are relatively inexpensive, can cost $20, but some can cost more, especially uh, these models, I think either $100 or $150. But then a second option, if you have a Roland Cloud subscription, is to use this thing, the WC1 Roland Cloud Connect Adapter, along with the Roland Cloud app you need to install on your phone. Now, this comes with a registration key with a year's worth of membership to the Roland Cloud. And using this, you can download models like the JD800 or the SH101 without paying anything extra beside what this cost and the cost of a future subscription beyond the first year if you want to keep using those models. The catch, though, is that you need to have this plugged in the back and near a Wi-Fi connection once in every 30 power cycles, in which case it will reach out to the cloud and verify that your subscription is still active. Now, as a service to my viewers, I actually powered the Juno X on and off 30 times without the WC1 plugged in. And indeed, at the 10 power up mark, it starts giving you a warning. And if you keep powering it on and off 10 more times, you'll no longer be able to use the extra content you got as part of your subscription. You will, however, still be able to access models that you purchased a lifetime key for. I don't think there's any limit on the number of synth models you can install here, but there is a limit on the number of sample-based models. You can only install two of them. So I installed the EXZ Stage Piano uh, Pack, and that has a few, uh, 
few interesting presets. And I also installed the World Sounds Pack. So quite a bit of samples. These are each, I think, over 100 megabytes. And like I mentioned, you can only install two of them. If you want to install another one, you need to remove one. Now, there's one more fun perk of this. And for this, I'll need to plug it in. If all goes well, this little Wi-Fi or Bluetooth thing comes up. So if I power up the app and it says that it's connected, that's a good thing, online Juno X. Now, the nice thing about this app, aside from the fact that you can uh, choose to install content directly through here, if I hit install now, by the way, then it won't let me because, um, yeah, this is 114 megabytes because I already have two uh, sample expansions installed. Anyway, if I go into any one of the packs, let's say J800 Cosmic, and just choose a patch here, you can see that it loaded that patch onto the synth. Let's maybe choose something else, Cloud Shift Bell. So that synced pretty quickly, Flavor Drift. So that's one cool aspect of this and I could go ahead and save this now as a user tone. That's a great way to audition Roland Cloud sounds. And the second nice feature here is that you can search both the Cloud and the Juno X for uh, any sound you like. So let's say that I was looking for an organ sound and hit return and sorry, go here for all the patches. So now I can see a bunch of organ sounds across the different preset banks on my synth or in the cloud. And yeah, just um, hit this one. Here we go. That's one organ. Maybe try this. So this, I think, is an extremely useful and compelling way to search for tones either on your synth or the cloud or both. Way faster, I think, uh, than just going through these, you know, one by one, looking for uh, for what you want. It would be nice, obviously, if there had been a search feature here as well. One final small power feature, if you hit scene and part, you'll get a list of all the parts in your scene, whether they're listening to the keyboard or not, whether if I ARP or not, whether they're I ARP is on or not. So you could turn it off or whether their sequencer is on step mode. So a really nice summary of what's going on in the synth. Let's talk about some pros and cons for Juno X. On the pros side, first in terms of sound, in my opinion, Juno X delivers the classic 80s and 90s tones it's expected to. It kind of feels like a Stranger Things in a box when you start playing it. In comparison videos I heard online, this can sound either exactly like or very close to a Juno, but its sound palette goes much farther than a vintage Juno ever could in terms of multi-timbrality, polyphony, and the thousands of other sounds in the Zencore engine, from pianos through guitars, strings, orchestral sounds, acoustic instruments, and I didn't cover this, but also 90 different effects types that a vintage Juno could only dream of, not to mention the samples and content you can download from the Roland Cloud or you can design on your own. So who is this for? Is it for people that wanted a Juno 106? For me personally, as someone who almost hit the buy button on quite a few Juno 106 auctions on eBay, yes, this does calm my Juno 106 acquisition urges, and frankly, I'm relieved not to worry about analog voices dying or a noisy chorus. Speaking of which, the noisy chorus isn't a good thing. You can turn it on if you like and get that uh, seashore vibe. But as far as I'm concerned, noise on a Juno course is a bug, not a feature. It's just something that happens to the circuit as it ages, and it can get very loud. Unless you intentionally want this in your mix, I'd just turn it down. So does it have Juno 106 mojo? That's up to you to decide, but it certainly has a lot of tones and features way beyond that. Another major pro, in my opinion, is the editor. Obviously, it would have been better to have a larger screen and proper onboard interface like the Phantom or the MC707. Regardless, the editor is a great way to figure out what's going on beneath the surface in this synth. Finally, a major pro, in my opinion, for Juno X is its multi-timbrality and the simplicity of the arpeggiator, the I arpeggiator, and sequencing. It's very easy to assign an ARP and a sequence to each part, and if you want to let the I arpeggiator take over, you can do that too. I didn't mention this earlier. If the I arpeggiator comes up with a pattern you like, you can always 
print that into a fixed sequence and just save that as a sequence within your scene. So what are the cons? In my opinion, probably con number one is yes, the fact that if you want to get into in-depth Zencore sound design as opposed to Juno X sound design, the only way to do it is using this small screen. Yes, if you have a computer nearby, then the editor solves this problem. But ultimately, when I'm using a synth, I'd much rather just use the synth. Now, if you're not into designing your own sounds, then this synth is a preset dream come true with thousands of presets on board, especially with the search feature that I showed you earlier. There's probably a sound out there that's close to what you're looking for, and you can fine tune it with the panel controls. That said, if you don't want to use the editor and only want to work on the synth, you're probably better off with a Phantom or MC707 if you don't need a keyboard. Anyway, on to con number two, that's the complexity of sound design and scene management. For me, the fact that there's a set of sound design parameters that live in the tone level and then another identical set that lives on the part or scene level, like I showed you earlier, was a source for quite a bit of confusion. Despite the fact that obviously I'm fully aware of this, I still found myself changing the tone when I meant to change the scene and vice versa. I think the way to solve this is just to make sure that when you choose scene or model bank, you're always changing either the tone parameter or the scene parameter regardless of the model. Then finally, two more cons, which might sound odd since I just said that the Juno X has slightly too many features, but if we compare it to other Zencore products, it would be nice if you could load your own samples and kits into here. And it would also be nice if we could have more than one pattern per part or scene, or to have patterns transition smoothly when we change scenes. These are features that exist in other Zencore products like the Phantom or the MC707 and the MC101. So hopefully they can bring those over here as well. So to sum it up, who is this synth for? I think it's for people who want a synth that looks and sounds like a Juno 106, but can do a whole lot more. And the compromise they're willing to make as far as advanced sound design beyond the panel controls is that they'll do it either in the companion app or on a small screen with a long list of parameters. So that's it for Juno X. If you like the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever expanding book available to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the bell below if you wanna make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching. Thank you.